It's King's Plate Week. We have one of the greatest jockeys in history and a tremendous legendary analyst, Joe Tilly's Great Canadian Sports Show. Coming up! Welcome to the program. Our guest today, well, he hails from Toronto. He is an original host of the Racing Network, a member of the Woodbine Thoroughbred simulcast team for many years, 24 years broadcasting at Woodbine. He's hosted numerous racing shows on CTV, CBC, TSN. He's hosted the Woodbine Mile, Canadian International, Queen's Plate many, many times. He'll be on the mic Sunday for the 2023 King's Plate. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeff Bratt. And this man needs no introduction at all, but he was born in Oshawa, began riding at 17 years of age, 6,450 career wins, 88.5 million in purses. He was a top rider in North America four times. He is the first jockey to win 500 races in one calendar year. He was a four-time winner of the Queen's Plate, an eight-time winner of the Woodbine Oaks, an Eclipse Award winner, a two-time winner of the Lou Marsh Award as Canada's Athlete of the Year. He, was a, he is a member of the U.S. Horse Racing Hall of Fame. He is a member of the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame. He is a member of the Canadian Sports Hall of Fame. And he is a member of the Order of Canada. Ladies and gentlemen, the one and only, the legend, Sandy Hawley. Gentlemen, so glad to have you on the show today. Great, Great to be, be with you. you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Now, Sandy... You won the plate four times. Never won the King's Plate. You weren't around back in the 50s. But from a, from a rider's standpoint, uh, what does it take to win this particular race? Well, you're going a mile and a quarter. These horses have never been a mile and a quarter before. So you definitely need a horse that relaxes in the race. You have a horse that's on the bid all the way, and the horse is going to tire himself out by the time he gets around there a mile and a quarter. So actually, uh, I won the Queen's Plate one year on a horse called Regal of Race. He did go wire to wire, but he was relaxed the whole way. So, you know, you can't go wire to wire as long as nobody pressures you and your horse is relaxed. Jeff, I want to touch on your, your, your story just for a moment here. How did you get involved in horse racing? Uh, to make Sandy feel really old, I, uh, I used to watch Sandy when I was a kid. Uh, I used to go down to Greenwood all the time with my dad. He would take me to the races. Bit of a funny story, Joe. My um, mom... She always give my dad a hard time. She would say, ah, but don't take Jeff to the races. Stop, stop taking him to the races. And I just, I, I would beg my dad to take me, beg him to take me. And um, then I went to school for broadcasting at Ryerson, which is now Toronto Metropolitan University. And then I applied for a job at Woodbine. And the rest, as they say, is history. So I got it through my dad. And I'll tell you a bit of an interesting story, Joe. I, uh, I would always buy the program. And I would always circle my jockey's favorite names. And uh, I would always circle Sandy's name in the program. <laughs> of course. Um, yeah. So he, um, he was one of my personal favorites. And then I got to work with Sandy on a fairly regular basis on the shows. And I was like, man, I'm working with the Wayne Gretzky of Canadian Horse. <laughs> and the fact that he was uh, just a great guy that he could just joke with all the time. And, I mean, Sandy and I have uh, some funny stories, some that we can tell on here, some that we can't. Um, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, an unbelievable guy, and I just I feel very blessed to call Sandy a friend. And Joe, I used to watch you on CFTO all the time too. So um, yeah, no, it got, it's, this is a real pleasure for me to be on with you two guys. Well, Sandy and I being around the block, there's no doubt about that. And Jeff, uh, you know, you you you've made your you've definitely made your name in the in the sport of horse racing too. So yeah, that's this is awesome. So, so I want to, Sandy, so well, have, you've been in the winter. Sorry, go ahead. No, Jeff bailed me out a number of times. He bailed me out a bunch of times. I remember one time I was late for the show. <laughs> I was doing something in the Josh room, and I, I went running down the front, and, and I missed the, the beginning of the show. Uh, they went to commercial break. They came back, and Jeff said, we found Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay, Jeff. Now, uh, 164th edition of the Queen's Plate. Uh, what's new this year? 
Well, the name, obviously, the king's plate. Yeah, yeah. you have to put the dollar in the jar. We were keeping track of that. I've called the queen's plate about a thousand times, Joe, so don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, uh -huh, yeah. Uh -huh. you, you know, this is a race in which, um, Joe, you're a big boxing guy, right? So I was kind of thinking about this coming in, trying to come up with an analogy for this. This is a heavyweight tilt that doesn't have, like, a Mike Tyson, doesn't have an Evander Holyfield, doesn't have a Lennox Lewis. It's got a lot of... Good horses, but not great horses as of yet. And I think from a betting point of view, that's a fantastic thing to have because the starting gate's going to be full. You're going to have 17 horses in it. It's a really wide open event. But remember last year, like Moira, she kind of came over with some flair because she won so big in the Oaks. And then, of course, she set a track record when she won uh, the Queen's Plate. But I, I I just think this is a very level playing field. It's, it's, a, it's a group. It's like the AL East. It, it, it's a group of really good teams or horses. They're all over 500, and you can make a strong case for a lot of them. And it's um, from a betting point of view, I think it's a fantastic race. We're, we're going to get into the, uh, the 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 analysis of the race a little bit later. But first of all, I just want to bring us back a, a bit now to 1973, Sandy. So uh, you've been in the winner's circle for that uh, for Canada's biggest race four times. Uh, what was it like winning with the queen and, 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 uh, you know, uh, you know, in, in attendance for 1973, uh, and which, which among your plate victories, which would you say was, was the, uh, the biggest for you? Oh, uh, you know what, Joe, they're all really special. Anytime you ride in the plate, it's, uh, it's pretty exciting and, and invigorating, but, um, I'd have to say maybe, uh, when I won on Regal Embrace, which was my, last queen's plate and you, you see mr e.p taylor there and it was for mr e.p taylor and 10 years before that i'm at his farm looking for a job to become a jockey mm -hmm. and 10 years later here i am in the winter circle with them on regal embrace and and regal embrace was a really good horse uh, trained by Mac benson and i would have to say him because of mr e.p taylor okay so uh um, unbelievable career you had uh, sandy but back in 1973 and 74 73 was a very special year you know that's the year you and asian colin wick uh went after bill shoemaker's record and you ended up smashing it you hit the 500 mark and of course you did that with a horse named charlie jr and uh what was the moment like when when you when you when you hit that magical 500 mark well, that's, uh, that was definitely the biggest role in my career, reaching number 500. Uh, we almost rode secretary in his last race, but Eddie Maple ended up picking up the mount from Ron Turcott when he got suspended. But So if I could have ridden secretary in his last race, that probably would have been the biggest role in my career. But, um, yeah, you know, I'd have to say when we won 500 races, that was our goal from the beginning of the year. And we ended up winning 515, but number 500 was uh, – it was the magic number, and when we reached that, uh, definitely the biggest role in my career was in Laurel, Maryland, uh, for a trainer called, called Dickie Dutro, and it was a tremendous, tremendous thrill. Well, about that time, some of the heavyweights in, in the racing business at the time uh, weighed in on what uh, Sandy Hawley uh, meant to the sport at that time. Vic, if you can roll that, that clip for us. When I was in high school, I didn't really have a big idea of what I wanted to do, so I started bothering my uncle. I says, well, when are you going to take me out for an interview to see if I can be a jockey? So finally, he called the National Stud Farm, and we went out, and I had an interview with a trainer by the name of Duke Campbell. And he looked at my hands and feet and said, well, I don't think you're going to grow too much more, so we'll give you a shot. I walked horses, groomed horses, and then I started galloping horses. I was on the racetrack for about three years before I ever got a chance to ride my first race. It was a tremendous thrill coming down the stretch, you know, head and head and just competing like that. I love competing. horses and I really enjoy racing and uh, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. It's just amazing that he can be so mild and have the fierce competitive spirit that he has. He is also equipped with all the attributes of a good rider. He's an excellent judge of pace. Horses seem to relax naturally for him and he has a great style and ability. Up till now he did more than any other jockey I guess in history. 
He's only been riding, what, four years, four or five years. It's, he's still young in his career. If he keeps improving, he could maybe be the greatest rider of all time. He has that potential. I don't compare top jockeys uh, ever. I just say there's no better jockey than Sandy Holly. <laughs> he's got the courage to win races. If he rides eight races a day, he wants to win eight races a day, and this means a lot. He's got a lot of ambition. Sandy Holly never quits riding a horse till he's past that finish line. Okay, so we heard from A.P. Taylor, Frankie Merrill, John Mooney, Lou Cavaliers. That's some very high praise, Sandy, from, uh, you know, from that particular time. Well, you know, uh, hearing that from those people, that was tremendous. Uh, you know, I just went out there and did my job every day and, and tried my best. And, uh, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to my agent, Colin Wick, and Duke Campbell, who I first started with. Uh, I remember for um, uh, about a month, I kept saying to Mr. Campbell, I think I'm ready to start riding, Mr. Campbell. I think I'm ready to start riding. And he used to always say, Sandy, Sandy, just calm down. I'll know when you're ready. I'll know when you're ready. And, uh, you know, when he started me riding, uh, Colin Wick was my agent, and I couldn't have got a better agent. So I owe those two guys a lot of credit. But uh, hearing from the gentleman that, uh, you know, gave me such nice praise, it's quite an honor. Thank you. Yeah. What was the toughest race you ever had, Sandy? You know what? I, I used to ride uh, Philly for Las Brera in California, and she was a stake horse. She was a really good Philly. <laughs> I can't remember her name, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to look that up because I get this, <laughs> this question a few times. And she was so tough in post parade. She used to lunge, lunge, lunge all the way to the starting gate. And we had permission to keep her moving all the time. So, we, and she was a sprinter. So uh, one day, uh, they decided to go a mile with her, and it was at Del Mar Racetrack. And as you know, um, Jeff and Joey, you have to gallop all the way around to the starting gate. Well, she was used to sprinting, and when we sprinted, we used to take her, turn her around, and then take her in behind the starting gate and just walk her in circles, walk her in circles. I was pretty dizzy by the time I went to the starting gate, <laughs> but she was, a, she was a really good filly. And so the one day that they tried to take her a mile, we got halfway down the back stretch and she froze and she started lunging and oh. then she wanted to go back behind the party gate. She lunged four or five times. She threw me off two or three times. Finally, the stewards called the outrider and they said, look, have Sandy get on the back of the pony, ride around the starting gate and just have the pony bring the filly around. Guess what? They never got her around there. They had to scratch her. So I say she's probably one of the toughest ones uh, <laughs> I ever rode. Kennedy Road was was tough going to the starting gate as well. And, you know, he tried to savage the pony pretty well the whole way to the starting gate. Uh, he was a tough, tough one to get to the gate. But as you know, he was a good one once he got there. Oh, yeah. Kennedy Road, a special horse, no doubt about that. So um, you've had some tough races, obviously, and, and, some, and some tough mounts that you talked about. But your toughest battle might have been with cancer. Tell us about, a little bit about that battle. Uh, you know, and, and how you're doing today with that? Well, that was about, um, I'd say, um, 35 years ago or so that I was diagnosed with uh, malignant melanoma, which is a form of skin cancer. And when I had the mole taken off my back, when it when it came back, it came back as as I mentioned, malignant melanoma. And unfortunately, I, I didn't get it right away. I hadn't noticed that uh, I had this black mole on my back, and it had uh, metastasized. And it was in its fifth level. So I went to a surgeon right away. I uh, had three, three different surgeries uh, because of the cancer. And uh, luckily, uh, I started getting some vaccine shots. And I changed my diet for 20 years. And between the vaccine shots and changing my diet, uh, actually, my oncologist said, I'm not sure if it's my vaccine shots or the way you're eating now. But let's just keep doing both. And luckily, I'm still here to be able to talk about it. No, 35 years. And you were at the time, I believe you were, were you given like three months or something like that? Uh, like a, the, the diagnosis, the prognosis was, was, was not very long, right? Yeah. You know, what's funny, Joe, is um, I had the mold taken off my back by a plastic surgeon and he sent it away to be analyzed. And it took a week for the biopsy to come back. And I could continue riding because I had just had this little scar of stitches on my back. So I remember coming here to Kentucky to ride in a stake race and it was at Keeneland. And I remember after the race, all the other riders were riding in the last race and I had the last race off. So 
I went in the shower and there was only one other guy in the shower when I was in there. And he goes, Sandy, what's that scar on your back? I said, oh, I just had a mold taken off uh, by a plastic surgeon. He sent it away to be analyzed. And he said, oh, it wasn't malignant melanoma, was it? And at the time, I didn't even know what malignant melanoma was. I said, no, he just told me to stay out of the sun and wait for my biopsy to come back. And he said, well, you're lucky, man. If, if it was malignant melanoma, he said, I had a buddy that had that. And he was gone in two months, passed away in two months. So here I go back and I get my biopsy. It's funny, after I got my biopsy from the plastic surgeon, I'm driving home. And guess what I was thinking, Jeff? <laughs> I'm not going to know who's going to win the Stanley Cup here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Well, and here you are 35 or 40 years later. And uh, wow. So that, that, that's a, it's a miraculous story. No doubt about that. Um, speaking of good stories, uh, I want to look back at before we move on to this year's play. Last year's play was pretty special. Uh, uh, and, you know, Sandy, when we had you on the show, you and I both called it. We both liked that Philly Moira, uh, beautiful Philly named after and the Shakespeare off. character played by Catherine O'Hara. And, uh, you know, she exploded down the stretch and she pulled away for, for that uh, pretty easy victory in a race record time. Uh, how impressive was that win for you? First of all, Sandy, what, what, what uh, stuck out the most for you about last year's race? Well, just a, a tremendous failure. Of course, he won the Oaks and, and uh, um, I think I could have won on that horse as well. <laughs> yes, it did it slow down the stretch and uh, just a very, very impressive win. I mean, she just, she just blew them away down the stretch. Jeff, what do you remember the most about Moira and, uh, and uh, how impressive was she in your eyes? Oh, I mean, she was, she was absolutely amazing. The thing that I just remember is when she ha had to turn a foot right around the three eights pole going into the far turn, I was thinking, wow, I mean, they're going to have to really run to get her. And then she just kept pulling away, pulling away, pulling away. And, you know, she relaxed so nice that right now she's got maybe four horses beat at this portion of the race. And it was a Great. pretty honest pace, as, as Sandy knows. I mean, if you're going 47 and two and a half at a, at a mile and a quarter, that, that, that's, that's scooting right along. And, you know, I, I, I knew quick. somebody was probably going to come from off the pace here, Sandy, because, I mean, they were, they were going pretty good clips up front in here. And, you know, I, I can't imagine. That's the one thing I always ask riders like a Sandy or a Rafael Hernandez in this case. Like, what is that feeling like when you know that you have so much horse underneath you and you have the field at, the, at, at, your, at your mercy? And here he uncorks the horse, and I mean, she's just absolutely gone. Mm -hmm. And it's just like Sandy. Is it almost like you get into a bit of like a, like a tunnel vision at this portion of the race? It just seems like this is where you get to enjoy things. You know what? You really do. Um, when a horse accelerates like that with you, and you start passing horses, you know, it, it's just an amazing feeling. It, it's uh, very yeah. It's uh, it's tremendous. There, there's nothing like it. And some people ask me what I miss about riding, and I say it's being in the winter circle with all that joy and everything that's going on in the winter circle and the feeling of accomplishment as well. Well, and you can see Raphael almost sat, stood up in the saddle there <laughs> and still had that unbelievable time, right? Yeah, I so, know. You know so, uh, so, so at that time, Raphael had just become a Canadian citizen, a new Canadian citizen, and Kevin Attard got his first place victory. And afterwards, Jeff, you had the chance to interview them. Let's, let's listen now. I don't know if you guys are aware of this or not, but she set a track record. Wow four a mile and a quarter yes uh, so yeah so she did she did some pretty good things uh, to say the least Rafi I want to ask you in the Oaks she made a huge turn of foot and it was almost like she made the same type of turn of foot what's it like when you push the button with her it's unbelievable you know where I grew horses you can get out of trouble so quick and they always got a second third gear like her you know you just set off safe ground and when you you want to get out of the, the uh, the horses in front of you, you know, they, so you just move out, she give you everything, she give me another gear when you turn for home, you know, she was unbelievable, thank you, X-Men group, here Mr. Kevin, he do the every, all job, <laughs> unbelievable, thank you for the opportunity, let me write this unbelievable filly, and uh, she's something else, she's so special. Has it settled in that you've now got that Queen's Plate? You've got the E.P. Taylor, you've got the Mile, and now you've got the big one, the Queen's Plates. Yeah, I've longed for this one for a while. <laughs> um, you know, it's, uh, I've been down this path with a few horses that I thought I've had chances. Obviously, I was really excited today uh, with this filly, 
uh, but it's just such a hard race to win and, and you don't know. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm here now and I got this trophy in my hand and it's like Raf said, it's a dream come true. Uh, I worked really hard. I, you know, I have a great staff and, you know, uh, the, the groom, Peter, the exercise rider, Karina, uh, my assistant, Denton, you know what I mean? He's on top of her with her feed schedule, making sure she's cleaning out the feed tub. And uh, it's just, uh, there's so many moving parts uh, why I'm standing here today. And, uh, you know, I mean, obviously... This guy to uh, to my left, Donato, he's uh, giving me a good opportunity. And uh, the guy uh, right there in the tan suit, uh, he's taught me everything I know. And uh, it's just a great moment and I'm so happy right now. <laughs> Such an emotional <laughs> moment. How, right. how are you able to hold it back, Jeff? It was hard. That's uh, That brought back a lot of memories uh, when, you, when you played that back because, you know, I could just... I think it was maybe a year prior. That I think Kevin had like four on the plate, and he looked really, really live in that race. And you're thinking, man, he's going to get it, and he didn't get it. You're like, holy smokes! You know, it's almost like the Boston Bruins. You know, when they they set the regular season mark for points in the season, and they don't get out of the first round, and then finally he gets it. And you know, yeah. the, the big thing too is like I, I think Kevin got really emotional talking about his dad because um, Tino obviously was a great mentor to him, and Tino never won the plate. And uh, no, that's some that's some great memories, man. I could watch that all day long. And you know what's kind of cool, Joe, is um, Moira's going to be racing on King's Plate Day. Uh, she's going to be racing in the Dan Smartly Stakes. So um, that'll be kind of cool to have a, a Queen's Plate winner on the day of the King's Plate. That's awesome, that's Sandy. What do you what did you what are your thoughts watching you know watching those interviews? Well, you know what, tremendous interviews, and and uh, Jeff and and Joe, as you know, I I did some interviews as well in the past. And it makes our job so much easier when you ask one question and they keep talking and talking. <laughs> yeah. and talking and it, it's awesome. You only have to ask them one or two questions and uh, it makes our job a lot easier. But, you know, you can see the emotion in the circle. They're very excited. And, you know, it's, it's just a tremendous feeling. Yeah, it's like winning an Academy Award. You, you've got to be prepared for <laughs> Some kind of a speech there, <laughs> but Ke Kevin was obviously uh, prepared. But whoa, a lot, a lot of years, right, wrapped up into yeah. that one little mm -hmm. interview, wasn't it? It's just like a whole career right there. Okay, so let's talk about this year's field, uh, the power rankings. I know Jeff, you're involved in, in in producing the power rankings, and at number one, you got Calic, uh, Chad Brown, trainee. Uh, he's uh, you know. Had six six starts, three of them victories, two hundred twenty eight thousand dollars in earnings. Uh, Kazushi Kamira rides. I understand that's uh, who, who his mount will be for this race. Uh, then Kaku Kaipu, uh, Ted Holder, the trainer, Alicia Field, Mark Cassie. Mark Cassie's got the number three and four ranked uh, horses in this one. And Kevin Attard, Mike DePaulo. Kevin Attard with Wickenheiser this time around, another filly. Uh, Twin City, Cool Kiss, Midnight Mount, Midnight Malibu. What uh, what are you thinking when you see this this list right here? What I love, uh, and Sandy, you can speak about this too. Is uh, horse racing is really unique. Here's here's Chad Brown, multiple Eclipse Award winning trainer, has won numerous Grade One races. He's got the top horse in our rankings, and who's second? It's a small barn. It, it's a barn that doesn't have a lot of horses. A horse they didn't pay a lot of money for. And this would just be an absolutely amazing story if Kauko Kaipu was able to pull off the victory. You know, sometimes you can spend $1.5 million on a horse and the horse can't run a jump. Sometimes you can spend $1,500 on a horse, the horse runs like Secretariat. Um, that's one of the real stories for me in this race is, you know, you've got, you've got like the Chad Browns taking on some smaller outfits and, you know, the smaller outfits have got a great shot. So, Sandy, for me, that's definitely one of the stories in this race coming up is the fact that you've got, you know, obviously Chad Brown's going to take a lot of support in this race, but mm -hmm. our, our local horses have just as much of a shot. Well, that's true. Sandy, what do you, you see know, there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I, I really like Kelly, too. You know, he his last race may not have been his greatest race, but I think he was three for three this year before that race. So he's got a lot of talent. He's got a lot of talent. He's, he's coming in here. He's never uh, raced at Woodbine, but uh, yeah. He, if I could ride any horse in the race, it would probably be him. And, and uh, I guess they got the leading rider in Canada who's uh, who's doing tremendous uh, in Kazushi. Um, you know, you look at uh, the other horses, uh, the horse that won the uh, Queen's Plate trial, uh, uh, Paramount Prince. 
you know, you got to like him too. He went wire to wire, whether they're going to give him an easy pace up there. Uh, that's, uh, you know, we'll find out uh, when the race runs. But uh, Party House, he was a favorite in the plate trial. He broke a little bit slow, and I think he would have given Paranel Prince a hard time on the lead, you know, if he had have had a good break. But, uh, you know, he had to come from last, and, you know, it didn't uh, didn't quite finish the way they, they hoped he would. But, you know, you got to throw him in there, too. He looks like a good horse and can never leave out uh, the filly that won the Yokes. And, uh, you know, she gets a five-pound weight allowance. so. It's really shaping up to be a great race. And as Jeff said, a great betting race as well. So, Sandy, you said that if you had the opportunity to pick a horse, you might choose Calic. Uh, have you ever picked the wrong horse in the plate? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm sure we have. My agent, Colin Wick, and myself. Uh, when, it, when it came to riding clicking horses and everything, Colin wouldn't even ask me who I liked. Uh, if I'd ridden two horses in the race, he would just pick one. But when it came to the big races, uh, your agent always come to you. If you've ridden two or three horses in the race, like, who do you like? And it was so tough. And I go, Colin, please, you just make the decision. I don't want to make the decision. <laughs> and, you know, he was he was pretty good, good at making the decisions. But, uh, yeah, we have chosen the wrong horse every once in a while. Uh-huh. Well, you okay, you mentioned Calix. So uh, here's rank number one for Probably has something to do with this. Uh, this victory at Belmont, Belmont a couple of months Trail ago. The right nine ridge stakes. Uh, Calic with the Rod Ortiz Jr. aboard here. Went gate to wire pretty much. A couple of horses challenged in the stretch, but uh, Calic, you know, shook it off and, and pulled away. Uh, you would you say, Jeff, this is the reason why Calic it, it would be the favorite here? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this was a good, good race. And the last time that he ran, um, you know, he was obviously in against very tough competition on that day. He was against grade one company, which is like the best of the best. And now he gets to face straight Canadian breads. But look at the stride here. He really extends the stride nicely in here. And he's got that interesting chrome on his left front. It's almost like a knee-high sock, as a matter of fact. So he's kind of a lot of fun mm -hmm. to watch. And Speed Horse have done very well in this race over the last several years. I know Moira obviously was the exception, our most recent race. But um the one thing that I, I kind of want to toss the ball out to Sandy in regards to a question here is the last time that he ran, he got really bad behind the starting gate. And I, and I wonder if, you know, with the big crowd, if maybe that's a possibility that, I mean, I just hope he, I hope he doesn't run his race before the race begins. That's, that's uh, somewhat of my concern. Have you ever had Sandy on big days, horses sort of lose their marbles for lack of a better term before the race even begins? Yeah, that's a good point, Jeff. Uh, you know, hopefully he, you know, he doesn't act up like he did in the uh, the Belmont Derby. Um, it, like I say, you, you have to have a horse that's going to relax. If he's nervous before post time, he goes to the gate. He's all washed out. Sometimes they run the race before they get there. That's a very good point, Jeff. Um, I had a filly one time that I was riding in the uh, I was the the International in Maryland, the Washington D.C. International, and when I rode her to the starting gate, it was for Marie Silbert. Bunker Hunt was the uh, owner. And I'll never forget, she was going to the starting gate, and she was all washed out. And I thought, oh, she's run a race before she even gets there. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, you know, I, I kind of felt bad. They told me to put her on the lead. and I thought it was just going to be a rabbit for Dahlia, who was in the race as well with Lester <laughs> Piggott. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, Marie Silbert told me, he said, this filly can really run. And, you know, if you can give her a breather, I think she can win the race. But I thought she ran, uh, ran a race before the race. And fortunately, fortunately for me, unfortunately for somebody else, a horse threw his shoe just as we were going to go in the starting gate. So we had to get off our horses. They took the horse back to the barn. Uh, they put the new shoe on. They came back. And we were off our horses for like 10, 15 minutes. Uh, walking, uh, the gate crew was walking our horses around. When I got back on her, Amazingly, she was dry as a bone, and she ended up winning the race. Wow! But I think, put in that starting gate, the way she was washed out, we probably wouldn't have won the race. Wow! So that that worked out. Somebody blew a shoe, and that uh, <laughs> and that worked out perfectly for you. Didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the number two ranked horse in this race uh, is we, sorry, is it Kalik or Kalik, uh, Jeff? What's the proper pronunciation? Uh, you say you sort of say it fast. Kalik, Kalik. <laughs> click, click. Okay. Yeah. Just say it okay. fast and then nobody, click, nobody notices. Like, click your heels. <laughs> click your heels. There you go. Okay. <laughs> click your heels and blow, blow a shoe. Okay. The number two horse in this race, uh, Kaku, Kaku, Kai, Kaku Kaipu, which I think is a proper pronunciation. Is that pretty close anyway? Uh, showed very strong in the Marine Stakes. Uh, 
great battle uh, with the favorite Turf King in the Marine. Uh, yep. an event, and it was a race that was eventually won by Turf King. Uh, it was trained by Ted Holder. Uh, Rico Walcott rode uh, Kaiku Kaipu, uh, Kaku Kaipu in the Marine. Uh, will that be the case here? Yes, he will be riding. And um, he's had a good meet, Rico. He's been a very good rider out west for a long, long time. And he's given it a shot out east here this year, and he's done quite well. Uh, this was a good run because um, you know, this was the first ever attempt going around two turns. Uh, Turf King was a Chad Brown horse, as a matter of fact. And um, it looks as if uh, Kalko Kaipu is going to win it, but the horse on the inside battles back to win it, that being Turf King. The, the mm -hmm. real tough thing that uh, Ted Holder had to work out in here was, does he go to the plate trial and then to the plate, or does he go right from the Marine to the plate? So this is a horse that's had a lot of time off and a lot of works uh, getting ready for this race. So he seems to be peaking right at the right time. You know, they paid just $10,000 for this horse. It's just a, wow. a, just a tremendous story. And um, he, look what he's gone on to do. He's, he's made a lot of money at this portion of the race. Now, obviously, the distance is a bit of a question mark, but it's a question mark for a lot of horses in this race who are going to be able to get them out of quarter in here. But um, he seems to be sitting on a pretty good race right now at this point. And I saw him school just the other day. That's amazing, Joe. Um, one, of, one of the perks of my job is our, our studio overlooks the paddock area, and you get to see these horses. They, they sometimes school at 11 o'clock or 11.30 prior to the race is starting. I saw this guy come over, and it was Kyle Kokai Poo, and I said, man, he's kind of he's kind of turned into a bit of a man all of a sudden. Like he's, uh -huh. the two-year-olds to three-year-olds, they, they just, some of them don't change. Like some of them from a physical point of view, they don't change. But he's kind of filled out a little bit. Um, he just, he looked good. I, I, I was really pleased with what I saw. So I've got my fingers crossed he's going to run a good race. He's growing up right between right before your eyes, eh? Two hundred twenty-four thousand yeah. dollars in earnings so far. That's a nice uh, that's a nice turnaround from uh, for a ten thousand dollar horse. That's a pretty good return on your investment, I would say. Sadie, were you impressed? Uh, it's, it's tremendous, and you know what I liked about him too is he lays just off the pace. He's going to have a perfect spot uh, in the Queen's Plate. He's probably going to be in, like laying fourth or fifth, and if it is a fast pace, he's probably going to pick up the pieces. So. Yeah, it is turning out to be a great betting race, and I'm looking forward to watching. So at Twin City, who's been in the money, uh, seven out of eight races was also in the Marine Stakes. Unfortunately, he was seventh out of eight in the Marine. Uh, any chance that he can bounce back in the plate, Jeff? You know, he's um, he's been a bit of a puzzling horse this year. He, he's a big horse. Like, you look at him, he is a, like he is a linebacker. You want him, like the Argos should mm -hmm. draft this guy. He is, uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a big, big boy. And, um, you know, he won the King Corey. Then in the Marine, what happened there was um, I was talking to Stu Simon. He, he did not wear a tongue tie in that race. And he, um, he, he cut off his breathing a little bit. And um, that's uh. why he didn't really run a jump there. So they put the tongue tie on him and the play trial stakes. And he ran a whole lot better to finish in third. So um, he ran better. He's going to have to run even better in the plate. This would actually be a really interesting story to see Boulanger win the race now, a member of the Canadian Horse Racing Hall of Fame. He, he's lucky to be alive, Gary Boulanger. He was involved in a very serious spill mm -hmm. early on in his career. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, that would be a kind of a tremendous story. You know, a guy in the twilight of his career, if he was able to pull off a victory like that. But, you know, he's he'll get the distance. Um, I don't know how quickly he'll get the distance, but he'll get the distance for sure. Um, mm -hmm. But um, he's definitely, he's he's I think he's back on track for sure. Right. And Kaku Kaipu, uh, two wins in seven seconds in 11 starts. So Kaku Kaipu might be a really good place bet. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's an interesting thing, Joe, that you bring that up because that was kind of the bad rap against him. And Sandy knows this very well. Some horses, they're herd animals and, and they don't want to pass, you know. And um, that was that was the thing with him last year. Like he would be a wonderful check earner, but he was so frustrating because he just he wouldn't win. But now all of a sudden he's got that, that knack down for winning which is nice to see right and and, and a little bit bigger a little bit uh, more manly as you mentioned okay yep. so uh we have we have a, a another filly this year that's drawing some attention woodbine oaks winner uh elysian field trade by mark cassie uh sahin sabachi the rider i'm is he i'm sure he'll be riding the in the uh, plane is that correct correct okay so um so, so he's first start as a jockey ever in the oaks and uh he gets the win in, in this race uh wickenheiser a stable mate of uh, legion field also in that race uh so she's expected to run the plate 
Let, first, let's get the call of the, the finish of this race from, from Robert Geller and have, have a listen. Inside of the half mile ahead to Fashionably Fab and only a length away, Ticket Tape Home jogging along in third. A length away in fourth, Tito's Calling making a run and starting to wind up is also in the centre, Elysian Field, 45.70 and Me and My Shadow are there. Big Brass Bed is coming as they start to pack up and Fashionably Fab joined by Ticket Tape Home. Wickenheiser's running on from the back pretty well and Friends for Life dropped out. It's Ticket Tape Home a length to Me and My Shadow and as they come for the home stretch, Tito's Calling third, then Fashionably Fab and Elysian Field down the outside. Wickenheiser running on with Big Brass Bed. Ticker Tape Home raced out too, but Elysian Field is coming. Elysian Field on the outside, the stable mate, and has run to the front. Wickenheiser down the outside and Big Brass Bed. Elysian Field in front. Out wider, Wickenheiser. Elysian Field clear. Wickenheiser now the center. Drifting, but Elysian Field. Sahin Savachi wins the Woodbine Oaks. Two and a half lengths. Wickenheiser second. 45-73rd. Me and my shadow fourth. So uh, Sahin Savachi winning the Oaks in his first shot. Uh, somebody else who won a few Oaks. And he won eight of them. <laughs> He's on his way to a pretty good start. Uh, what, Eddie, what are your thoughts when you watch that race? You know what? Uh, he really is. And, uh, you know, I had a, had a good agent, so he got me some good mounts in the Oaks, and uh, we got to win it a few times. But, uh, yeah, I, I like the way Leeson Field uh, ran that race. He came from off the pace. Uh, like Jeff mentioned, there's going to be 17 horses in the Queen's Plate. It's going to be a big field. It doesn't seem like she minds being in behind horses and, uh, you know, she got eased out at the right time to make a run and she finished strong and she's going to get a, a five pound weight allowance, uh, with the boys here. So, you know, you can't leave her out for at least won this race before. Uh, recapping that race, uh, Jeff, what are your thoughts when you see that one again? And, and Wickenheiser coming on strong as well. Yeah, both ran great. Uh, both have got a great shot in this race. Wick and I just had so many obstacles this season, you know, just one thing after another. Kevin just said a setback after setback, and finally it seems like she's kind of on track, and she's got a tough tough act to follow if she's going to run like her namesake, because obviously we all know how good Haley Wickenizer <laughs> is. But, um, you know, uh, Wickenizer is good, and Lissy and Fields, um, she just was very professional, I thought, in, in that race. And what I love, Joe and Sandy, about our – schedule here in Canada as opposed to the States. In the States, they have the Kentucky Oaks the day before the Kentucky Derby. So you never really mm -hmm. get to see Phillies going in the Derby anymore. Mm. I love what we do here in Canada where you have the Oaks and the play trial on the same day, and then it's spaced out nicely so the, the nice Phillies can come back and race in the Kings play, and they've done very well throughout the year. So, I mean, I kind of like the fact that we do it that way here. I mean, they used to have the Derby trial a week before the Kentucky Derby, but now everybody wants spacing between races. That's just the way it goes right now. Um, but I, I like the fact that we've got, I mean, I think they're the Lysian Fields and Wickenizer, they're two of the stronger contenders coming up in this race, which I think is tremendous. Yeah, that that is an excellent point because uh, you know, how look how many Phillies recently, especially, have won have won the plate. And uh yeah, you're you're eliminating those horses when you hold the oaks the day before. Was there ever a well, time, Joel, Sandy, I, when the Oaks was closer to the plate? or? Yes, it was. It was the day before the plate. I remember uh, it was on the same week as the uh, Queen's Plate. I remember a number of times where, you know, I'd won the Oaks and then going into the plate the next day. So I agree 100% with Jeff. Uh, it'd be great to see the Kentucky Oaks uh, like a month before, right around bluegrass time. When they run the bluegrass. That would be fantastic to, be, to see Phillies uh, running in – you know, there's there's Phillies that didn't run in the Kentucky Oaks and then ran in the Kentucky Derby, but uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to see them spread out like that. And yeah, yeah, back in the day, I, I think it would have been fantastic to uh, have more Phillies in the in the Queen's Plate back uh, in the day when I was winning like Oaks and, and Queen's Plate. That would have been great. So what we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, quite a few Oaks winners win, winning the plate in in, in recent years. Uh, for whatever reason, we don't see a lot of plate trial winners uh, winning, mm. winning the plate. And Paramount Prince, another Cassie uh, trainee, is the number four ranked horse in, in the power rankings after going gate to wire in the prial, uh, plate trial stakes. Patrick Husbands rode Paramount uh, Prince in the plate trial, and I'm, I'm assuming that Patrick will get the mount uh, again on, on Sunday. Uh, what are your thoughts about Paramount Prince and uh, that gate to wire victory at 11-1? You know, Sandy, um, this is, uh, again, one of the great reasons why we love this sport. Uh, Paramount Prince is bred by a small breeder. Um, she's able to have a, a real nice chance now to win the plate. I mean, you get Patrick that's able to wire the field here on this particular occasion. 
Uh, one of the owners of this horse, Mike Langua, he this is the first horse he's ever owned. And he had this horse last season under the care of Jamie Attard. And all of a sudden his phone rings at some guy named Mark Cassie. He wants a piece of the horse. <laughs> and um, and uh, he first turned Mark down. That was for Gary Barber. And then I guess they bumped up the offer. So now they own it 50-50, it sounds, sounds like at least. Um, so Paramount Prince, just a, a real unique story in here. And you know, the only worry I have is if he, if, if he needs the lead, um, what's the pace pressure going to be like in this race? Can he sit off of it if need be? Um, that That's kind of my question mark with him. I mean, obviously, he finishes up really nicely here on this spot, but I'm just a little bit leery of the fact that there might be a little bit more of a log jam up front here, Sandy, potentially in the in the Kings Plate coming up on the weekend. Well, that's the thing. If, if he can get on if he can get on an easy lead, holy mackerel, that, the way he accelerated down the stretch, if they let him get an easy lead, he's going to be awfully tough to beat. <laughs> and sometimes you look for special things in a horse or, you know, a rider or a trainer or something or an owner. Uh, a special story to be able to cheer for that horse. And Jeff, you come up with, with a good reason to be able to cheer for Paramount Prince. Yeah, and you know, I, I think what Big Red Mike was the last uh, plate trial winner to win the, mm. is, uh, what it was. I think, yeah, it's just, I so think it's, you're right. it's been quite a long time. And and, uh, and so Cassie was, I remember in the interview what he did after the uh, the Oaks, and, and he seemed to be really high, high on Elysian Field and mentioned the fact that, that Elysian Field had a better time than the boys did in the plate trial but you know you saw that paramount prince like you know they challenged he got he got challenged at the top of the stretch and it was almost like he looks over his shoulder and says <laughs> I, I don't think so <laughs> and, and he, he you know you talk about having another gear so that was that was pretty impressive and i i just you know looking at that again it's what, what do you think what do you think sandy he looked like a uh, tribal chief winning the uh uh, the legends race I mean, uh, <laughs> the horses came to him and i was able to give him a breather so you know if you give a horse a breather and i know Pat's husband's had that opportunity um shame on you you, you know he's going to accelerate again and that's the same thing as when i rode in billary when she won the international if you can get that easy lead and you know you can give the horse a breather around the turn he's going to accelerate for you and they're going to have a hard time catching you so it's going to be a fantastic race. It's going to be an interesting race and fun to watch. Yeah, I said he's, of course, referring to that great legends race uh, a number of years ago when, when uh, all of the greats I didn't mean uh, of all time <laughs> got on, like, were on there. And Sandy blew the field away. And that was pretty impressive, Sandy. No doubt about that. Of course, yeah, some of it has to do with the horse. I will grant you that. <laughs> But I want to know, Joe, I want to know if Sandy's going to come out of retirement to try and win a King's Plate. He's won four Queen's Plates. Yeah. Any chance he's going to come out of retirement right. to try and win a King's Plate? Yeah, yeah, let's talk no, about that, Sandy. I know your, your weight's good still, isn't it? Oh. I beg your pardon? Your weight's good still, pardon isn't me? it? Your uh, weight? Your weight is still good? I may have to hit the box for my very first time in my life. <laughs> you know what's crazy is when I was getting ready for the Legends race, the big pin guy called me, and I had a month to get ready. And I lived across the road from Winfield Farms. And I remember when I was riding, I used to lose a lot of weight when I got on horses in the morning and rode in the afternoon. And I think that's what kept my weight down. And I weighed 125 when the fleet called me. I had a month to get ready. And I started getting on horses over at, at uh, Winfield Farms across the road from where I lived in Oshawa. And by the time I went down to ride in a legend race, I weighed 108. So wow, getting on those wow. horses in the morning, the weight just blows off me. So uh, you never know. I, I might have to, might take me a couple of months to get back in shape. <laughs> <laughs> well, so forget about Weight Watchers then. Uh, the, the key to losing weight is get on the back of a horse <laughs> and it'll just come right off you. Yeah. Yeah, that that's pretty case, awesome. Me, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't. You have. I remember stories. Of, didn't you tell me stories that, that uh, you know you see guys uh, heading to the hot box and everybody else you'd be you'd be chopping on a hamburger or something. <laughs> or was that Pat? Was that Pat Day? Maybe. <laughs> no, that was me. That was me. But it wasn't a hamburger. It was a fudgicle. My fudgicle kept melting. So <laughs> maybe that's why I didn't have very many friends. <laughs> Well, that's pretty awesome. So, okay, we we size this up a little bit. Uh, 
Jeff, I, I know you're, you don't like to pick the winners, but do you, do you have a, a, who, who do you think is going to go off as a favorite here? I, I think Kyle Lick's going to go off as the favorite. Uh, I, I think he will be the favorite because the Chad Brown factor, you get Kazushi, um and his last, I mean, his last race is a bit of a toss out in there. Uh, I'm leaning towards Wickenheiser. I don't know if I'm going to pick her on top, but I'm going to pick her somewhere for sure because I think she's going to go off at a decent price. And I think she'll get the distance. I think for the first time this season, things are kind of lining in her direction. But, um, but I definitely respect Kalek. And I think I think the horse that bounces back with a much better race is Stanley House. We haven't touched much on him, but um, mm. he um, he did not have a good trip last time. But as Sandy said, he kind of broke a little tad slow, and it was almost like he wasn't interested. And all of a sudden, Javier Castellano is going to come up and ride. And you know, a bit of an interesting story, Joe. Mm. The last um, Derby winning rider to come back and win the plate was Flavian Pratt. And of course that was a controversy mm-hmm. one because that was uh country grammar who uh, finished second against Medina spirit, then got the win uh, once, uh, once all the investigations took place and then he came back and won the, right. uh, the plate itself with one bad boy. But I'll tell you, Sandy, I'm, I've been impressed with Javier. You know, he, he's kind of rejuvenated himself this season. You know, he, he won the Derby with Mage. He, he won the Belmont with Archangelo. It's a real nice guy too. And it just seems like he's, He's somewhat back on track, I guess you could say. You know, you hit the nail on the head. He he is a fantastic guy. <clears throat> and he's the type of guy that you like to cheer for, too. And he, he has. He's researching. And, you know, you, all you have to do is win a couple of stake races, and all of a sudden people start, start putting you on more horses. And as Joe mentioned, all you need is a horse. You got the horse, That's you it. got shot the winner. <laughs> and you know what? I like Hardy as well because he was actually the favorite going into the plate. He had a bad break coming out of the starting gate. Uh, like Jeff said, he broke awkwardly and uh, had to come from last. And you know what? If he's a bit of a price, I wouldn't be afraid to bet on Party House. So is that your gut, uh, Sandy, your gut feeling that uh, that Party House is going to be there? Well, if, if I still had a horse to ride in the race, it'd be Kabalik um, because of his form yeah. before his last race. And as Jeff mentioned, too, have, a, have an eye on him when he's in post parade, and as he's mm-hmm. going out to the racetrack, too, if he's bouncing around, he's all washed out or whatever, he might run his race before he gets there. So that'd be interest, something interesting to keep an eye on as well. But what about the Swiss so pick? We need the Swiss pick here. Enough of us. Well, we need, okay, we need, we need. okay, you know you know what? <laughs> I, I just, you know, I, I just watching it again, oh. Elysian Field to me is, is okay. to me, that's, there's my Swiss pick. There you go. <laughs> Elysian Field, and for my exactor, Elysian Field, we'll go with the top three favorites here, so I'm not really going off the, off the board or anything like that. But Elysian Field, Kalik, and uh, Kaku Kaipu, that's my pick for the Exactor box and the tri and the triactor box, right? So uh, there you go. That's my 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 that's, my that's Swiss pick, and, and a lot of people lost money on the Swiss picks before. So <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you, Joe. I've been a long time viewer. Before we go, how did you get the nickname the Swiss? How did that happen? Okay, so so that's. Uh, you know, okay, it's not that complicated. So my real name <laughs> is is Tillapa, right? My le- okay. my my real la- my real name is Clarence Joseph Tillapa. And at one time when I was working out west, I used to go by CJ, and I worked by going by Clarence, and and then uh, because my producer, the uh, news director at the time, would like me to go by Clarence. And anyway, when I moved to Toronto, um, my uh, Pat Marsden. Uh, yep. said to me, you know, after, after I met, had the meeting with uh, Douglas Bass and Ted Delaney and, and, and Pat said to me, he said, uh, what's your middle name? And I says, Joseph. Jo-, and he says, what do you think about calling yourself Joe Tilly? And I said, well, if it means coming to Toronto to work from Lethbridge, you can call me <laughs> whatever the hell you want. <laughs> and, and, but, but, I guess the point being that the name Tillapa is a Swiss name. Ah, and so I used to, okay. I used to go by, I, but I mean, Ukrainian would have worked too, but you know, Joe, the youth didn't seem to have the, you know, the, the, the cachet and, and some people might find, find that offensive. So Joe, the Swiss is what I went with back in the day when there was a Jimmy, the Greek and, and everything else. Ah. And, uh, so, uh, right. So, so uh, I used, I used that for my, for my pick. So there's a story. That, there of, we go. Uh, Joe, the Swiss. Well, when you were a boxer, Joe, was that your boxing name as well? Right. No, my boxing name was Piston Fist, my nickname. <laughs> but I was CJ, Piston Fist Philippa, right? Right. Piston Fist. 
Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's the story there. Uh, and, uh, thank you guys so much for being, for taking this time to join us today. That was a blast. Gotcha. And, and uh, we, we will get together and do it again next year. And it, it'd be so much fun as we always do. And, and uh, Sandy, great to see you again, my friend. You're looking fantastic. And I wouldn't be surprised to see you on, on some, the back of some, uh, some horse next year in, in, in the in the King's Plate because that's one race you have never won. So can I tell you one quick story about Jeff again? If we got time, one quick story about Jeff. Again. Yeah, 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 yeah. Of Please. course. Uh -oh. Make sure it's clean, Sandy. I, <laughs> no, I had a handful of penis before I went out to do my hit to uh, say which horse I was going to pick down on the apron, and I washed it down with some water and everything. And I, I thought I had my throat cleared. I get down there and I go to do my pick and. Jeff Brad says, uh, all right, Sandy, who do you like in here? And I go, <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't talk about the penis throat. And Jeff said, sounds like Sandy is all choked up about his pick. So <laughs> Jeff, you <build> me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's dancing on your feet. That's, uh, that's, that's uh, you know, going with the flow. Yeah, choked up about Jeff it. Said, Did your horse win? <laughs> More most importantly. <laughs> I can't remember. Listen, they, they, yeah, 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 probably, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, so there's something to be said too. Uh, in, in, in waiting until the last minute before you make your before you lay your bet down, because you guys talked about, hey, we're gonna have a look at you know some of these horses and, yeah. and, and have they run the race before they get to the to the gate and, and uh, those types of things. So yeah, yeah, quite important. Thank you so much for being in the program, and uh, we'll uh, we'll see how things go, and and uh, hopefully, folks. Uh, enjoy the races because it, it, it'll be a fantastic day on Sunday. Some amazing races there, of course, and and, and the King's Plate should be a uh, classic. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Joe. All, best, Joe. All right, more sports when we come back. Get ready for an exhilarating ride as Canada's oldest and most prestigious thoroughbred race enters a new era. Woodbine Entertainment proudly presents the King's Plate. North America's longest continuously run stakes race. Join us on Sunday, August 20th for the 164th edition of this prestigious $1 million race. It's an event like no other, a symbol of true excellence in Canadian sports. You too can rule the day of fashion, food, and world-class horse racing at the King's Plate, August 20th. Tickets at kingsplate.com. Okay, time for my Woodbine Swiss pick of the week. Last week, I took the number four horse, Fenor, in the sixth race on Thursday's card at Woodbine, a $111,000 event, a mile and a quarter on the E.P. Taylor turf. This was a two-horse race all the way. Fenor led most of the way, but Milagre do Sol with Sofia Vives aboard took control on the stretch, pulled away for the victory, 201 and 8-6, a quick trip. Kevin Attard is the trainer. John McCormick, the owner. I did have the 5 4 exact here, so yeah, it worked out okay. It paid $44. This week, of course, we're going with the 164th King's Plate. As mentioned earlier, I'm looking at the Philly Elysian Field. Makes sense that the first King's Plate in 70 years would be won by a Philly. I also like this combination for the exactor and triactor. So go to woodbine.com for all the latest racing info. Go to kingsplate.com as well. You can also get the latest from Woodbine Thoroughbred and Woodbine Standard Bread on Instagram and Twitter. Go to hpi.bet.com uh, and darkhorsebets.com for your wagering options. Attention security seekers. Ready to take control? Introducing Corporate Protection and Investigative Services, your ultimate solution. Retailers tired of losing profits to theft? Our retail loss prevention experts have you covered. Mobile patrol, close body protection, insured door persons, we've got your security needs covered from all angles. Background investigations and civil recovery programs, trust us for thorough solutions. Licensed by the Ministry of Solicitor General, fully insured and bonded. Visit www.corporateprotection.ca or call 
1-800-827-1692 for top-notch security and private investigation services. Guests on Joe Tilly Sports receive a gift certificate from Classica Imports. Top of the line, imported men's clothing. Check out the Classica Essential Collection now. Go to shopclassica.com. Joe Tilly here. My wife, Penny Claire, and I recently took an amazing trip to Egypt and Jordan with Trip Oppo. And here are our top 10 must-dos. Another must-do experience is a luxurious cruise down the Nile River. The ship was elegantly furnished with premium facilities, including a spacious lounge and a swimming pool. The cabins were comfortable, well-appointed, offering panoramic views of the Nile River and the surrounding landscape. I would highly recommend that you book your next trip through Trip Apple. Call them today. And we want to thank all the folks who make this show possible. These are friends, trusted business associates, and all-around great people. We highly recommend them all. Thank you for your support of Canadian and local sports. A reminder that the show is available on iTunes, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public, Google Podcasts, and Pocket Cast, as well as the Spanglish Network, Zingo TV, and Buzz TV Live. Also, check out the show on YouTube. All of our past great shows in there, some shorts, some clips. Like and subscribe. It's absolutely free. There's lots to take in, folks. Thank you once again to Sandy Holly and Jeff Pratt for being in the program. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week. Addiction Rehab Toronto, Toronto's number one alcohol and drug treatment center, saving lives, reuniting families. The only treatment center in the province to offer medical detox, treatment, sober living, and lifetime aftercare all in one place. Our unique and specialized programs are designed to equip our clients with the tools to successfully lead a life of dignity, respect, and purpose. Let us help save your life or your loved one's life. Call today for more information or to facilitate an intervention. 1-855-787-2424 or visit addictionrehabtoronto.ca. Brian Gribben Insurance Planning, helping you solidify your financial future. At BGIP, what we do that's unique in the marketplace is we show people how to spend and enjoy their money in their early years of retirement without the fear of running out. Also, we're able to do this without you having to change financial advisors. Please look us up at bgip.ca today. Let's book a 30-minute phone call to see how we can bring value to you and your family in your planning. Call Brian today for all your retirement needs. We did. 905 686 Five six seven eight. MNP, a leading Canadian national accounting, tax, and business accounting firm. MNP proudly serves and responds to the need of their clients in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors. Through partner-led engagements, MNP provides a collaborative, cost-effective approach to do business and personal strategies to help people and organizations to succeed across the country and around the world. With local offices in Oshawa, Mississauga, Burlington, and more, their team is here to support you. Visit mnp.ca today to learn more. Do you want to buy or sell a home? Could 31 years of real estate experience help you? Why not speak to an amazing team that loves to overpromise and overdeliver? Aldo has a tremendous team of experts on staff. They are committed to making your next real estate transaction smooth and comfortable. Call 416-GET-ALDO or visit getaldo.com.